This week on the Hollywood and Toto podcast, I share some of my celebrity junket stories and why my questions no longer reach the rich and famous. We talk with the husband and wife team behind A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay and why kids programming matters more today than ever. And I recommend a new documentary that had me smiling from start to finish. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. Before we start, I'd love it if you subscribe to the Hollywood in Toto podcast. Got new episodes every Wednesday, plus more and more bonus episodes on the weekends. Check it out. Back in the day, I interviewed some of the biggest stars in Hollywood. I'm talking Jack, Jack Nicholson, Kevin Spacey, Albert Brooks, Dwayne Johnson, Sylvester Stallone. Man, I interviewed them all. I was working at the Washington Times back then, and movie studios would send the big stars to the nation's capital to do a whole bunch of interviews with a whole bunch of journalists, including me. Those junkets allowed the actors to talk to maybe 12, 13, 14, maybe even more journalists at a single time over the course of a day. And then, of course, they would all spread the word about their movies. And then they'd fly to the next city, and the formula would kick in all over again. It's pretty smart. Now, sometimes I got a chance to interview the actors one-on-one, and sometimes I'd have like maybe two or three journalists with me. But again, it was pretty good FaceTime, really. At the risk of being a little unprofessional, it was kind of cool. I mean, I got a chance to chat up a legend like Albert Brooks. Amazing. But that's no longer the case. Now I'm based in Denver, and the celebrity junkets just don't touch down in the Mile High City like they did back in uh, D.C. Post-COVID, I can't remember a single big-time interview opportunity I've had in Denver since then. And that stinks. Now, besides the fact that I enjoy films and it'd be kind of cool to see some of these stars, but also, you know, there are very few journalists who will ask the kind of questions that I would ask the stars. Not being boastful, it's just true. I mean, I would challenge them on their political beliefs for starters. I mean, I wouldn't be mean, I wouldn't be cruel, but you know what? If you're going to get in a soapbox, well, then you should be able to answer some tough but fair questions, and that's exactly what I would throw at them. And I'd certainly ask the stars about cancel culture, big tech censorship, and a lot of related issues. I mean, they are artists. Free speech is their tool and trade. They should have opinions on these issues, and I'd love to hear them. Instead, now I get so many opportunities for virtual press conferences. Well, frickin' Here's the fine print attached to a chat I got with film legend Martin Scorsese. He's out there promoting Killers of the Flower Moon, of course, the big movie in the award show circuit. And here's the note I got. This is not an open forum Q&A. Please feel welcome to submit questions ahead of time. Not all questions are guaranteed to be answered. Oh, yeah. Well, what's my question? What would I ask? Well, Mr. Scorsese, Disney's stopping your film Kundun from being streamed on any platform these days. You can't even find it on Blu-ray. Any thoughts? The backstory there is that his 1997 film about the Dalai Lama angered China to, (laughs) well, you know, China is easily offended. And Disney just does everything possible to memory hold that film and also to appease China. They love those business ties they have with the communist nation, and they don't want to see them suffer. Now, if Scorsese came to Denver, and it was just me and him chatting, or even just me and a few other journalists, I would absolutely ask that question right to his face. And then he'd be forced to either answer it or publicly say he can't. A-list director fears angering the mouse house. Or A-list director slams Disney for censoring his film. Either way, it's a story and it's informative. Now, is there any chance that that question would make the final cut in a virtual Q&A? Well, what's the old saying? It's between Slim and none and Slim left town. Now, I understand why a few dudes would want to steer the conversation away from questions like that or anything remotely controversial or even remotely off topic. They want to promote the movie. I get it. It makes sense. But you know what? These virtual press conferences... They're just making sanitized conversations. They're not really getting to the heart of the matter. They're not letting journalists do their job, dig in, ask some tough but fair questions. And you know what? 
I have zero interest in being a part of that game. One of my favorite celebrity interviews ever came in Pittsburgh. Gosh, it might have been 25 or so years ago. I got FaceTime with Fred Rogers. Yeah, that's Mr. Rogers, a Pittsburgh institution and, of course, part of the beloved TV show that everyone knows. Now, we didn't have a long conversation, but I remember every time I would talk to him and ask him a question, he would answer in that sing-song voice he used on his old show. And every time I did ask him a question, he would answer it politely and then turn it back on me. He wanted to know what made me tick. Super ordinary, generic me. Man, he was the real deal. And I thought about that conversation when I was Zooming the husband and wife team behind a new Daily Wire TV show. That's Katie and Ryan Chase, and they clearly found inspiration from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Their new show is for the young ones, and it's filled with sweetness and smiles, trust me. It's called A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay. And let's be honest, it's not aimed at me, And, you know, my kids are a little bit older now. They're in their teens, so they're not going to be watching it either. But, you know, for the show, I wanted to sample it, and I ended up watching it with the same kind of wonder that a kid would. It was really interesting to experience that. I think they're on to something with the show. And once you hear the show's theme, it's going to burrow in your brain and set up camp. And that's a good thing. Trust me. It's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day. Well, it's a wonderful day. It's a wonderful day with Mabel McClay. I'm coming, Jasper. I'm coming. That's why I invited them on the HitCast to learn more about their creative process and how Mabel McClay fits in with the Daily Wire's mission. Remember, they're trying to offer an alternative to the new woke Disney. This is part of that mission. They explain why. Now, you're going to hear a brief audio glitch or two in the conversation. It happens early, not long. You'll get the gist of the conversation, but I just want to give you a heads up ahead of time and also quick apology. But, you know, this is technology. It's imperfect, but I think you'll get the flow of the conversation. And more importantly, I think you're going to like what they have to say about the show and about being a parent. And if you're a parent yourself, you might even love it. Katie and Ryan, thanks for joining the show You know, when I was watching A Wonderful Day, I'm thinking, of course, of Mr. Rogers. There's something of that spirit here, but this has its own unique feel, different characters, different music. But when you think about Mr. Rogers and how he connected with children for such a long time, was that in your mind when you're creating a show like this? How how do you kind of take a kernel of what he created, which was so wonderful, but then make it all your own? That was absolutely the... uh, the the thought and inspiration was, yeah, to take that that nugget of uh, um, those of us who grew up watching him and, and uh, generations before, and then yeah, how do you make it uh, your own? And um, you know, we, we could never uh, we could aspire to be in the in the realm of uh, Mr. Rogers, but um, you know, he really set the bar, and so that was the the main focus was to uh, really connect with uh, the kid, uh, the viewer, and um, make it a. Uh, um, you know, make it a, a, a something that is a, kind of a modern version where it's a little uh, children's show that's got a slower pace, mm-hmm. um, but it meets kids where they are at, in their attention spans. And, um, you know, and we've added these other elements, but uh, absolutely the uh, the connection with the, uh, the viewer like that was uh, was of utmost importance throughout the developing of it. I think the most important piece for capturing the spirit of Mr. Rogers was to focus on the character of Mabel. She's Mm -hmm. a character who speaks really gently and calmly to, to the child watching. And so um, we were glad to kind of tackle that first and then thinking, how do we make this our own? Well, we brought in Jasper, the hilarious puppet (laughs) dog friend of hers into the world. I Um, love Jasper. And love Jasper. He's (laughs) so funny and just brightens up every scene. And, and then we added this little stop motion piece of the show called the town of Bannerberry, um, which is so sweet. And we think that um, we also take Mabel on these big adventures. And so those are really fun, I think, to, to switch everything up. Yeah. You know, it's funny. My kids are 12 and 14 now. So I've kind of gone through a bit of this process about what the shows they're watching, what they're interested in. And everything is so fast paced, even a Pixar movie, which can be sweet and wonderful. It's go, go, go. It's got a, a certain vibe to it. And your show is more gentle. It's like a hug or a, 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 a maybe even a nudge from a loved one. It, 
Talk about that kind of storytelling, because I, I would fear that you might get advice, oh, you've got to quicken up, it's, this is a modern world, but it's so refreshing and it's so sweet, and you've worked with children extensively, but talk about that in greater depth and why that matters, why it's important, and why kids are a-okay with it. It was so important to us. Um, we have three young children, and so we really wanted to create a show that we were comfortable letting them watch, basically our dream show for our own children. And mm-hmm. we see how those hyper-stimulating shows really lead to um, some not-so-great behavior when we try to turn it off. They seem to be just kind of out of sorts and dysregulated when you turn it off. It's so clear that it's not good for them. And so... Um, I guess our main our main goal in initially tackling the show was let's mm-hmm. slow it down. We know this from working with children. We know this as parents that the, they can. And really what we had was a trust that kids can sit through content that feels grounded and like real life pace and not like TikTok or something. Um, and and they can. And, and I think we found that. Yeah. And we know that there's plenty of uh, stuff out there for kids to go get that sugar rush of fast editing and, and crazy, uh, uh, music and, um, just, you know, that, uh, that kind of, um, crazy attention span sugar rush. And, uh, you know, we know (laughs) from our kids and life experience, you know, you can't, uh, they would eat, they would eat just straight up, you know, sugar all day long. Uh, I would too, actually. So, (laughs) you know, uh, who wouldn't at this point, uh, (laughs) but you know, the, uh, the ramifications are terrible. And, um, and so the same thing we just saw, there was a, uh, uh, probably a place if somebody would take a chance um, in the in the market for uh, for something that was a little slower, a little uh, has that vintage feel, and as a focus on the connection uh, with the kid instead of trying to chase their attention, um, trust that uh, a kid can can um, uh, can sit and wonder and digest those uh, those themes and thoughts, and uh, hopefully be inspired to go out and. Uh, uh, do some of that after the show's over. So um, in, in the same way that when you re- sit down to read a book with a kid, you don't have to keep uh, snapping your fingers or sh- ringing a bell. Mm. They're in, they're on board. They're like, read this story to me. And so we we kind of modeled the show like that. And you know, it's funny. We a, okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just, I think we were at a slight advantage because we've never created seasoned professionals who were like, no, kids shows do this. And we were like, yeah, they do do that. But we actually have a different vision. And so we did have to fight for it a little bit. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that played to our advantage. What I was gonna say was, I, I think for me, listen, I'm not the demographic, it's for young children. But there's a sense of wonder in the show. And there's a sweetness to it that grabbed me as I'm watching it. And I think when you have that or those elements, then the children are on board, then they're waiting to see what's next, what's coming next, what's what's the next arrival on, on the show. And I think that really does work. Uh, you know, obviously, The Daily Wire, in a way, did everything it's doing right now to counter Disney and to make stories that won't lecture and indoctrinate. It's just sweet stories that you could walk away from as a parent and know the kid will not be, you know, facing anything that's inappropriate or disturbing. So it sounds like a, an obvious question, but Talk about that that manifesto in a sense and how it weaves into A Wonderful Day. Well, um, you know, we have a lot of friends who have all sorts of different worldviews and, and even if my collection of mom friends. And it's funny, we all agree, all of my friends at least agree that there are certain topics that we just want to kind of hit first and we want to speak to our children at the right developmental stage. We want to use the language that's right for them and that can differ from kid to kid within our family. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're intentional about what we're doing with this parenting thing. Um, and we believe that that when we put on a show for our kids so we can cook dinner, that, that we don't want them getting hit with any topics that we haven't hit first. And so uh, we believe there's a gap in the market for that. And it's become of a bit of a problem, unfortunately. And we're happy to be part of the solution. Yeah. And Ben Key was just awesome about it. They were they, um, you know, asked if we had any ideas. We told them we had this dream idea and uh, and we're not political people. We're, uh, you know, creative types with a young family and um We've uh, you know worked with kids for a long time, and that's been our focus and our our uh, our, our joy. And uh, so we said we had this idea, and they were like, they just immediately were on board and said, "Great!" Um, and and there's no uh, you know there's no hidden agendas. There's no we're just we're just making um, we're just doing our best to put a little light out there and uh, something um, uh, uh, good and that, that we think is wholesome and nourishing and uh, entertaining. And um, 
and we're just very thankful that they they were absolutely on board. And as you said before, that that really has been their focus for the whole um, their whole uh, Bint Key initiative. So mm-hmm. uh, we're we're just uh, we're just glad, glad to be asked. And it was fun to make a show that focused on the values, the sort of timeless classic values that we all agree on. Um, that I think that's a, a, a optimistic focus and having a having a wonderful day and believing that life is wonderful, the sort of spirit of optimism around the show feels really in line with that. Yeah, it's also oddly, you know, rare in today's culture. I think we can often be so cynical and snarky, a lot of meta oh, sure. references, and this just seems like a breath of fresh air. You know, when you think about, you know, your parents, you've got young children, it's it's the perfect test to see what's working, what's not on your show. But as parents, do you go about your day and maybe one of your children does something or says something or even ask a question and all of a sudden a little light bulb goes off in your head and thinks, gosh, that would be great for the show. That's a, that's a theme. That's a, is, is that happening all the time now? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Even the, the developing of the show, um, at the time we were uh, living in Florida and we had our kids, um, we had built a, a, a make-believe little town that we now have in the show called Banterbury and the kids were uh, animating the puppets and we were kind of doing... Um, uh, you know, running little stories that they were improvising and, and we were helping and, um, and letting them guide it. And so, yes, absolutely. Uh, and besides the fact that uh, our middle child, our five-year-old daughter, you know, uh, just before sleep, she'll just ask you a absolute soul rocking question. You know, go, what? <laughs> Does time exist? <laughs> she is that what way. What are yeah. you? Do, but I think- is life a dream? <laughs> <laughs> no. I think that when you do have young children in the house, though, you are constantly bombarded with their social emotional development. Mm -hmm. Um, And so things things are new to them and things are tricky for them. So, yes, we often are like, wow, yes, birthday parties are tricky. Let's think through that. And certainly a lot of inspiration comes for episode ideas from that kind of stuff. Now, you owned a children's improv studio in L.A. Uh, I don't know if you still do now, but I was kind of curious about that experience when you're working with kids, when you're just gently prodding their imagination and making them open up. And, of course, kids can be so open and so wonderful. But how did that influence the show? I mean, were there specific moments? Was it just getting to know these kids and the variety of opinions? How did that? I mean, that seems like the perfect case beyond being a parent, obviously. But that's, that's wonderful, too. But how did that flow into your current project? But we missed half the begin- middle of that question, but I think the beginning you were talking about um, how did uh, our running our kids improv studio yes, uh, yes. affect? Um, well, it was uh, just awesome <laughs> for <laughs> us. It was we had uh, we, we we it was just man. We we were so lucky. We were in the right place at the right time with so many wonderful families, and it was all word of mouth. And um, uh, and we were just. I mean, every class you'd see a, a kid who maybe was a little shy and he's three classes in or three weeks in and you're now watching them, uh, you know, blossom, so to speak, uh, have a little courage or they're just the, the, the rewards were infinite. So mm-hmm. however much by that, we were infinitely more. Um, so, yeah, it really uh, helped uh, shape us um, uh, and guide us well it we didn't know we were going to be here with a kids right. later but clearly uh-huh. that was uh laying some groundwork um but we had an enormous focus in our program not on making kids hilarious or child stars or anything like that some people might imagine that's what a children's improv studio in los angeles is up to um, but we were always very focused on teaching life skills teaching someone to be a kind scene partner who who's a team player um teaching them to have courage and teaching them to listen to each other and make eye contact. So this show, the development of the show felt like a really natural extension of all that work. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. That's the great part about the, the kids, uh, improv, at least for us, you know, at every level of it, it's, it really just isn't the being on stage, you know, the kid, the kids have to learn, uh, you had to be a good audience member when you're sitting there and how can you be, uh, uh, kind, how can you help the folks on stage by just being in your seat and helping, uh, you know, being in the moment when, uh, yeah, suggestions needed. So it was, um, it was, it was absolutely, uh, uh, wonderful. And, uh, and yeah, it, it wasn't focused at all on, on uh, steering kids towards Hollywood. In fact, we were probably we probably gave that advice uh, zero times. We were like, no, 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 wait, uh, childhood's way more important. And then uh, they'll choose what they're going to do when they're older. But uh, don't 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 pursue that now, please. That's right. Uh, even though there were some very sparky kids uh, to come through there. I want to have you both put on your critic's hat in a way and look at other. And you don't even have to name the names of the show if you don't want to. But what do you think is 
I guess, you know, to say what's wrong with children's programming today may be a little bit coarse and maybe a little bit too vague, but when you see children's programming, and I maybe whether you've watched it just as parents or maybe just as preparation for the show, what do you think they're doing wrong or what do you think they could be doing differently um, that, you know, just as, as a consumer and as a parent? I think that the way we speak to children really matters. And I think that there's maybe been a trend of um, speaking to them in a way that doesn't honor their intelligence, that doesn't trust that they can hear big vocabulary words, um, that doesn't trust that they can sit in a moment of silence and wonder. And so I love this about Mabel. I love that she walks through her house silently. She doesn't kind of look into the camera and keep tap dancing to keep them along. We allow the composers who were so talented on this show, this beautiful Mm -hmm. scoring to kind of carry us through from room to room. She trusts their abilities uh, to, to, to quietly sit and wonder, to take time to think, to take time to ask their own questions. Challenges them to kind of keep up for the younger viewers to like, keep up. We're mm-hmm. talking about a big topic today. And I think in this way, it's appealing to older siblings, parents and grandparents. We've received some of that feedback that it's not a show that kind of feels obnoxious or anything like that, that that everyone can take it in together. And it comes from the fact that we delight in children and honor their intelligence and expect a lot from them. Yeah, and we know that when we have, you know, um, we haven't had uh, TV in our house uh, much, or actually up until recently, we, we've always had a little uh, uh, projector and you know, I've curated, you know, the DVDs and things. And it's usually classics. Uh, well, it's all classics. So the kids are like, when did when did they stop making Andy Griffith show? I'm like, oh, yeah, long time ago. <laughs> Uh, they're like, there's no new ones. I was like, no, we're all caught. <laughs> you know, there's that heartbeat of you're like, oh, I haven't seen this yet. Okay, we got to stop this. Or if it's something, even if it's something you have seen, it's 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 neutral. You're usually having to mute it, or you know, it's a uh, it's a clanging bell kind of thing. Like, oh, okay. And so we uh, we are very purposeful. We hope our show isn't that. We hope it's. Uh, um, something that they can put on to maybe keep the kids uh, occupied while parents are cooking dinner or doing uh, what they have to do, but also that the whole family can enjoy and you wouldn't have to be waiting to, oh, we got to mute that part. I can't stand that sound or whatever the thing is. And so mm-hmm. that, that's been our uh, experience with uh, with some, um, you know, newer content, I guess. But sure. uh, yeah, they pretty much just think Andy Griffith is still on, <laughs> on the air. So. <laughs> you know, just let them let run with that. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. It's a great show. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, obviously you're just out of the gate and you've got a few episodes available now. Are there, you, you talked about the timeless themes, uh, you know, being generous, uh, creativity, things like that. Are there certain subjects that you're just itching to, to tackle that you just haven't gotten to yet or anything, themes or, or, or just parts of the human behavior that you're just so eager to explore, but it's just also new, you just haven't gotten there yet? Well, um, season one has 20 episodes, so they are rolling them out really slowly on Saturday mm-hmm. mornings because we like the idea that Mabel isn't a show that should be binge watched. Um, <laughs> at the end of every <laughs> at the end of every episode, she says goodbye. She goes outside and she leaves us with the line um, until we see each other again. Always remember there's lots always. Let me try that again. Uh <laughs> And, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting there's my lots lines. To keep wondering about. There's lots to keep <laughs> wondering about. So she says, until we see each other again, there's always lots to keep wondering about at the end of every episode. And she goes outside to wonder and um, enjoy the outdoors. And so um, we wanted kids to be able to take that time to let these themes sink in over mm-hmm. the weeks as the episodes roll out. Um, so this season... We, Uh, Among those 20, we have kindness, we have teamwork, uh, which is a really fun one. We get uh, Mike Rabel, the head coach of the Tennessee Titans, teaches me to throw a football on the 50-yard line. So that's (laughs) a really fun episode. It was a fun one to make. Um, And we really kind of hit four different categories of types of values that we look at. We look at kind of social interactions. We look at being a good contributing member to the family. And then, of course, these sort of creative ones and some that um, are are great for families of uh, of all faiths to kind of build upon that that perhaps hit some of those like contentment and forgiveness. Um, So we really explored a lot in season one. But yes, we are currently uh, developing uh, seasons two and three to to go even uh, further. Mm -hmm. So there's there's plenty of... uh, there's plenty of ground there. Um, just even in our own family, there's always, yeah, yeah. There's always a new uh, a new thing with uh, with uh, three uh, growing kids. So they're always uh, they're always bringing a new circumstance. We're like, ah, okay, let me just let me write that down. You just uh, 
we got we're going to explore that in the show. I won't That's tell right. you what to do now, but wait for the show. No, we'll, <laughs> we'll do that to our kids. Yeah, we're not parenting anymore. We're just, <laughs> yeah, we're just, just showing them the show. That's right. Uh, they may have to get a stipend now and then just for all their creative work. They're doing, they're doing a lot yeah, of heavy the, lifting here. The, yeah. The worst <laughs> is I just talking to our kids through their agent and manager. I'm just like, come on. <laughs> That's right. Awful. <laughs> it's awful. They have writing agents now. That's right. like, what? Uh, they they grow up so right. fast. <laughs> they do grow up so fast. You, know, you don't know your ABCs. How do you have a writing agent? Okay. You know, obviously the show is a lot of fun, but one of the things that I cover on this program is that pop culture matters. It's why I do what I do. It's why I cover the subjects that I cover. And obviously it's a message that, that you are participating in. You're making the world a better place with this show. I feel like there are some people, whether they're parents or maybe they don't have children, who don't understand the power of pop culture. I'm just kind of curious... This is the work you do. This is the, uh, the maybe the impetus of, of some of the work that you do as well, above and beyond this program. Can you maybe share a little bit about your thoughts on that? Why pop culture matters? And maybe, maybe it sounds like an obvious question, but I think we often dismiss it. Oh, it's just a TV show. Oh, it's just um, I'll watch it or not watch it. It's not a big deal, but it, it does have an impact on people. And I just want to be, either one of you can just touch on that a bit. Oh yeah, you'll. Uh... Well, everybody knows, you know, you'll uh, you'll be singing a song in your head. That little earworm will get in there. Uh, not the thing your parents said with all mm-hmm. of their sincerity and the moment they thought they really delivered it. No, you'll, you'll be singing the chorus of that song. And uh, if that song doesn't have any um, value, any intrinsic uh, worth there, you're going to be singing, you know, uh, what a what a bummer. It, it could have been uh, you wish you were singing something good and um, uh, something that could uh, help you and nourish you, uh, your your mind and your your heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I know uh, we, we had a great moment with our, our daughter for, uh, with this. Uh, we did not know this was happening, uh, but you were you were there for that when she um, we have a backyard tree. And our, our oldest, uh, who's seven, he's been building uh, uh, stairs up to uh, he's been making them um, makeshift uh, tree house. And she she's been afraid to, to go up that tree because she's five. And she watched our show about courage, and uh, Katie heard her out there singing um, the end of the song. Oh gosh, the book about courage, yeah, courage, and courage, the, courage. Yes, the you little, can do things when you're scared. Yes, courage, courage, courage. You can do things when you're scared. She was just out there singing it to herself. Didn't realize we could hear, and then climbed the tree. Yeah. Um, so and, obviously, yeah. so so meaningful, and and we hope that children would walk away from our show with those with those little nuggets, but I think more broadly, we're people who believe that children are sort of empty vessels and what we put in matters. And, um, and so what we show our children and what they listen to, all of those things build the little people that they become. Yeah. That's a, that's a great story. Um, and it's, I'm sure you're the lump in the throat was pretty obvious when that, when that was happening, (laughs) you know, uh, before I let you both go, the shows are still pretty new. They're just a few weeks old now, but I'm kind of curious. Yeah, just any any kind of feedback that you've heard that's been unique or unexpected. Well, a piece of feedback we're starting to hear is that children want to write letters to Mabel. And I've met some real kids who recognized me, even without my red hair, <laughs> and um, immediately came running up with questions for the Wonder Wheel, things that they're wondering about and really hope that I answer, which is so sweet. We're hoping to collect a lot of those and, and use them to build future seasons. Yeah, we've heard, you know, just lovely, you know, you, we put a, we made a thing, you put it out there, you don't know how it's going to be received. And we've, we've had such lovely feedback and even the folks I think that were uh, suspicious and you know uh, of Daily Wire and making bin key you know as people have shared some of those reviews and mm-hmm. um, and by the end they uh, the stuff we've seen they, they say well there's really nothing here and there's also this kind of sweet show maple <laughs> and, uh, and there's you know these other shows and so we're we just feel uh, hopefully that that continues and folks uh, even if they're coming in looking for something uh, that's uh, awful or bad they're suspecting maybe they'll be won over by it we are. Uh. I bet they will. But uh, Katie and Ryan, thank you so so much for joining the show. The new program is A Wonderful Day with Mabel McClay. It's playing right now on the BenKey app or just go to bentkey.com for more info. Keep up the wonderful work and I hope those kids keep on inspiring you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mentioned earlier about how cool it was to meet Albert Brooks in person. Of course, this was a while ago, but those memories are still strong with me. It's just amazing. I recently watched Brooks in This Is 40, which, by the way, I highly recommend. Might be the last really good movie that Judd Apatow directed. I, something's gone wrong with him. His, his newer stuff just doesn't have the, the same pop, the same humor as his older, better films. But Brooks plays Paul Rudd's dad in the movie, and of course he steals every scene he's in. 
Is anyone surprised by that? He's a genius. But I thought about that watching that movie is that we haven't gotten much Brooks in recent years. He's been pretty quiet. Now, he has been acting a time or two, so he's been keeping busy to a certain extent, but I miss his movies. I miss the movies that he writes and directs and stars in. They were so good. You know, when I talked to him, it was for the film Looking for Comedy in the Muslim World, but that was back in 2005. You know, he never calls, he never writes. I just, we just lost touch. But, you know, he also wrote a comic novel. I think it was about 2011, but he hasn't written or directed a film since that Muslim-based comedy. I just miss Albert Brooks making me laugh, and I want him to do it in his way, in his films. But I got a little bit of that just recently. There's a new documentary. It's called Albert Brooks Defending My Life. It's on Max, the platform formerly known as HBO. And it's a fan letter from a very old friend who happens to be Meathead, Rob Reiner. The Reiner went to high school with Albert Brooks back in the day, and that's when they first became fast friends. Except by then, at that point, it wasn't Albert Brooks. It was Albert Einstein. That's his real name. No lie. Now, the two reflect on Albert's incredible career during the conversation. Uh, they show some of his wacky TV performances and, of course, clips from great movies like Mother and Lost in America. Now, Albert is 76, and he's still charming. He's still funny. He's still self-deprecating, and he's just fascinating to watch in conversation. And, of course, the fact that these two people are old friends, they have a, they have a comfort level where they could talk about things in a way that maybe uh, a generic interviewer couldn't get out of him. No, I confess, I grinned when I first saw Albert Brooks. They had an early clip of him on a talk show, and I never really stopped smiling through the whole movie, just soaking in all those memories, all those great movie clips, and the banter between these two old friends. It does matter. And listen, Rob Reiner is not doing an uh, an investigative expose on Brooks. It is just a recollection of a very funny man who had a very funny career and is still alive to share some of those memories. Now, If you were making a better documentary, maybe you dig a little bit deeper. You find out why Hollywood clashed with Brooks from time to time. But this is just a chance to revisit a legend in the industry and to find out a little bit of what makes him tick. And I think you do get that from the film. If you love Albert Brooks' movies like I do, Defending My Life is just an absolutely gift this holiday season. Well, that's it for the show this week. Thank you to Radio America for having me as part of their great podcast lineup. And of course, while I have your ear, I hope you'll drop by HollywoodInToto.com. I update it seven days a week. You've got news, reviews, commentary, and all the crazy things that are happening in Hollywood. It is, like this show, the right take on entertainment. It's been woke-free since 2014. I'll see you next time. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Jumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Jumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.